our final panel discussion of the day. It's been a long day, so I'd like to thank you for your participation and your attention. Our final panel discussion will discuss how to make synergies amongst esports stakeholders, game companies, governing bodies, teams, etc. So without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and start our panel by welcoming the panelists to the stage. Starting off with Shinji Nakamawa, the uh, Director of Global Business and Development from Konami. Next, I'd like to welcome the Director of Team and Federation Relations from ESL, Jan Palmer. Next, from the Esports Observer, Content Editor, Graham Ashton. And last but not least, the Esports Chief Growth Officer from KSV Sports, Arnold Herr. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me here up on stage. And for all of you in the audience, we will have one final question and answer session immediately following this, and then that will be the conclusion to our day. So uh, I'd like to go ahead and start our panel by working our way down and discussing the topic of how to make synergies amongst esports stakeholders, game companies, governing bodies, teams, et cetera. I think we have representatives from each of those categories kind of represented here up on stage. So I, I think. Basically, because each one of you represents kind of a different uh, chain, uh, you know, chunk of the chain, we're going to uh, kind of uh, give you each an opportunity to talk about the synergies that you're looking to build uh, from your unique perspective. So starting off with Namakama-san, when you look uh, at developing synergies as a game developer, what are you looking for uh, as, as far as your relationship to teams, to uh, esports stakeholders, uh, other companies or governing bodies? What is it that you're looking for? So um, as a publisher, um, I think we have been you know, providing a lot of leagues and the tournaments, events, where the player can enjoy our games. and. Uh, you know, um, and having fun with it and using the esports format by ourselves. However, it's like our most um, challenging part for us is reaching out to the community all over the world. So community is very important for us. I mean, we always listen to their, you know, voice, you know, opinion, feedback, and, you know, um, in order to, you know, improve our games. So, um, the if the parties like you know a federation or a government or any it's like a pro team work with the publishers and you know fill in the gap between the community and then us, um, that would be make some great synergy and uh, make esports you know community bigger. I think. All right, so working on developing the uh, synergies between the community and the publisher, that's very important. Uh, now, moving forward to Mr. Palmer, uh, when it comes to ESL and your role in uh, navigating the negotiations between uh, ESL and uh, or team and federation um, relationships, uh, what is that like and what are the synergies that you look to develop in your relations with federations? Um, well, we, we see ourselves as uh, some of the spider in the net. We, are, we, are, um, <coughs> we have millions of people on our, on our online platform playing, playing dozens of, of, of different games and we are of course organizing big, big competitions for, for, for publishers. So we, are, we, have, we have a lot of communication with, with all relevant stakeholders. But from my perspective, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty new in, in the industry. I'm, I'm from the, the classical world of sport. And um, my observation is that we still have uh, a lot of, let's say, chimney communication. No? So and that we, we are not aligned on, on, on platforms and that we are missing a forum where, where the whole industry, just like, like this, uh, uh, talks about relevant issues and problems and, uh, and, and, and the future. And uh, it would be very, I, I would be very happy if federations, the IESF and other stakeholders would would support the idea of, of, of building those, those forums and, and building those platforms because this is definitely necessary for the growth, the quick growth of eSports. 
Then moving forward, I'd like to go ahead and pose a question to Mr. Ashton down there. What is your role as part of, I guess, the media when you look at the development of esports and the different, you know, uh, links in the chain? Uh, what is your role as an esports kind of observer uh, to, uh, what does it look like to you when you think about the way that the synergies are starting to develop between um, players and teams and tournament organizations and publishers, what does that look like to you? Um, I think in the past we've actually been a platform for certain team owners to express grievances they've had with uh, tournament organizers. Um, we One of our most read articles this year was um, H2K Gaming's Richard Lip, who, uh, who was a, a chairman for the, um, for the team, basically, you know, he, we gave an interview where he basically just said everything he found difficult about the way uh, the ULCS was being run. And so whilst you know we would want it to be the neutral party to Switzerland, as it were, to, to put that out, um, we did feel that there needs to be a place for um, you know anyone, players, team owners, um, any part of that chain to kind of vent their frustrations. I think we're in particular, we have a, a specific place is that because we're a business publication, we're a business platform, we also want to target the future stakeholders of the esports industry. So anyone who's looking to invest, anyone who's looking to um, to find their kind of place in the industry, and they've come in knowing very little, or as we've seen a lot, nothing uh, about it. They basically need a, a quick education. They need to know like how the tournaments are run, how the ecosystem works, how how you know they need to know what those communicate. If the, if there isn't a strong communication channel between teams and organizers, they need to know why. And and our goal is to kind of explain, you know make sure everyone has a clear explanation of where they fit. To provide a platform to explain or ex express those uh, synergies, or at least what you're, uh, what you're primarily concerned with. Yeah. All right. And then finally, at the end of the uh, row of chairs, as far away from me as possible, uh, Mr. Her, in your role with KSV looking to develop a new esports, you know, multi-gaming organization, um, it's very challenging. So what kind of synergies uh, are you primarily looking towards uh, developing with your team? Yeah, I think, I think the challenge is real. Um, you know, the way we look at it is we view ourselves as kind of an accelerator uh, in, I guess, the, the five-party model that exists between teams, leagues, players, fans, uh, and publishers and sponsors. Um, so what we really believe is that we can be that accelerator that you plug in uh, whether it's you know working with the right sponsor or that really wants to understand the fan base, that really wants to understand the players, a game publisher that really wants to understand hey feedback from players and from fans, what do they want to see? Uh, I think we're really that accelerator that can plug in, uh, but it also means that we have to kind of manage the the chimneys uh, as you as you mentioned, which which is a challenge for us. But you know we view our role as as really critical to accelerate the industry to where we think it will be. Um, so that's kind of our role, is to make sure that everything and all the pieces actually work in a line together. So I guess one main question as esports is, you know, developed but is still by far in its infancy when it's compared to traditional sports or like we uh, compared it at the start of the day to the Olympics, still has a long way to go. Uh, in that development of esports, where do you see yourself as this accelerator? What are the synergies that you're looking to make that really help uh, develop and accelerate your players or yourself as a team? Um, what does that look like? So I think you know one of the biggest pieces probably for this audience that could be helpful, uh, especially because it seems like more of a business audience here, mm -hmm. uh, would be that we are the closest to the fans and the players. Um, we know exactly what the fans want, what they want to see, what content was exciting, what content wasn't as exciting, uh, whether it's social media posts, whether it's video on demand, whether it's live stream, we see it all. Um, so I think in terms of the synergy that we can provide is, you know, uh, as sponsors are looking to begin to understand esports and figuring out what they, how they could get involved in this hot, I guess, rocket ship that's existing, you know, we can really be that voice of the fan, uh, of the players, uh, and make sure that all the different pieces align so that when, we, when there is a sponsorship deal through a league or through a game, that it's executed in a way that's high quality, that's executed in a way that's fun for fans as well, that isn't, let's say, tone deaf towards like, the game community. Um, so that's something that's very important for us. And I think that's kind of the, the synergy that we provide, is that we provide you know, a direct access to fans and players, but in a way that can work with the corporate system. So I think that's kind of the unique role that we play. 
That uh, is very unique. And uh, while uh, Mr. Hurt was talking about the role that the team organization provides, that interaction, that connection to players and fans, uh, Mr. Palmer, I wanted to ask for a little bit of your perspective about the synergies that uh, your role at ESL develops, because uh, you are able to provide a strong relationship between the teams that participate in your tournaments and the publishers that you know put the tournaments on. So what kind of synergies uh, would you say that uh, ESL specifically offers uh, to teams and publishers that come together um, there? Well, that's basically part of our business model that we organize tournaments in a professional way and, mm -hmm. and can offer this to teams as well. And we've already founded, uh, like two years ago, WESA, which is a World Esports Association where we play Counter-Strike with the best teams in the world and they're associated to us in a way that enables them to have a clear set, set of standards and a clear set of rules and compliant rules and all observed by, by uh, anti-doping standards and with the help of e uh, eSport Integrity Coalition. So we are, um, we are trying to create our own small ecosystem that is um, somehow living up to the expectations of, of, of professional professional teams and and Ken Hirschman, uh, the, the commissioner, he's he's here. I don't know if he's in the room right now, but he's he's here in, in, in Busan for this conference. So, yeah, that's that's what what we try to furnish the teams with. So, what is your effort then to uh, go to a publisher and say, well, we can provide this professional atmosphere? But what does it look like when you try to uh, develop that synergy between the tournament that you're looking to put on with a publisher and uh, the teams? What uh, what does it look like when you try to uh, either approach them or they approach you to try to develop that synergy? Well, that's it's it's always a discussion, huh? right? Since, as you rightly said, I, I don't, I don't know if we were in the infancy. Perhaps we are in the adolescence, but we're, it, it's, it's not everything set, set in stone like, in, like in the Olympic movement. What Vlad said, uh, told us about uh, how, how long it takes. Huh? Right. They've been around for a hundred years, and we've just been around for, for a couple of years. So there's still much room for open discussion and for, for development together with the publishers. And that's, I mean, that's a great thing. Huh? So to Namakawa-san, when you are looking, what is the perspective of the developer when it comes to, you talked about being very concerned with the community and listening to feedback there. Uh, what in your um, position do you see when you look to work with a, uh, an esports organizer to put on a tournament? Um, what are you looking for as far as synergies to develop? Yeah, it's like uh, I say, it's like you know, as a publisher, it's like we actually own our like league, and uh, you know, uh, trying to you know uh, expand our like game and the esports business. But you know, it's like you know, it's kind of hard to you know reach out like an all over the world, like uh, such as like you know, we haven't been held any events in Africa or any anything like that. It's like you know, a you know, federation or any 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 organization could help us to you know, reach out to those kind of you know market. That would be great for us, you know to reach out and expand our you know, game. So what you're looking for as a publisher is to uh, develop synergies, not just with the player base, but then to look for organizations that can help you reach that player base in uh, new locations that you haven't yet expanded to. Right, that's correct. I mean, it, it is kind of have a limit on resources or anything, so, you know, so if you know, somebody could then help us then reach out, that would be great. So I think a main discussion point here when it comes to uh, people at different points in uh, you know, the eSports the e chain, the eSports, uh, uh, I guess, web, if you want to connect it like that, is that uh, there needs to be a way to communicate everything at the same level. I know Mr. Palmer was talking about the chimney communications that oftentimes develop that tend to isolate certain people outside of the conversations being had. So um, I guess since we discussed this uh, briefly, I guess, uh, earlier, uh, maybe talk about what it looks like ideally uh, to have everyone in the conversation. What, it, what needs to happen for that to take place? Um, well, f f first of all, I think we have to un understand where, where our challenges are. Huh? And obviously, we are sitting on a rocket, and it's, it's great. I mean, it's, it's, it's great to be here, and it's great to be in, 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 this, in this ecosystem at this very time. Excellent. But still, there are problems. Cheating, 
uh, corruption, uh, betting. Uh, it's a, it's a still it's a not not very educated market. So uh, we have to aim at educating the players, uh, educating the whole ed ecosystem, and becoming more professional um, as quickly as possible. And for this, I would uh, I would encourage us all to have this this platform I've been speaking uh, before about to. To, to, liaise with, to, to align with all the publishers, to liaise with, with all the, the, the big e event organizers and, and find common ground on certain issues. Huh? This, this could be done with, with the help of IESF, I'm pretty sure. So th this is definitely needed because right now every, every publisher, every big e event organizer basically does it on, on, his, on his own, which, which is great. And I, I'm, everybody knows the rules, for example, of Riot. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a big book. You need like days to really peruse this, but I, I think the industry, it, it can be expected from the industry that we find, find a common ground on, on, the most, on the most challenging issues, and this, this would be my recommendation that, that, we, find, that we find a group of, of publishers, perhaps associated to IESF, and, uh, and, and discuss, discuss the most important issues. That's, that's definitely needed, and I think this is what, what, uh, what is expected from us by, by other stakeholders like uh, society, <laughs> uh, like right. administration, or <coughs> by by politicians, and uh, um, I think we we are we, we should have the self-esteem to to clarify those issues ourselves and to to create our our own ecosystems ourselves without external help. Huh? We all know this this famous uh, Ronald Reagan quote. What's the mo most uh, ter terrifying word uh, sentence in the English, English uh, language? I'm I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Huh? <laughs> so um, I, I think we should avoid this and and try to to um, to do it ourselves. Huh? We, we we can. Uh, so Graham, just to use you as a representative for kind of the community observing all of this as you uh, report on uh, different issues or occurrences going on, um, what is the, the perception or the communication uh, like in, in your role as kind of a, not a, quite an intermediary, but uh, the platform via which the community kind of perceives all of this. What does your role look like as kind of the communication part of this whole synergy that's trying to be developed? Um, I mean, the, the issue is I think a lot of um, esports fans, enthusiasts, whatever you want to call them, they're, they're not very privy to how teams are run and particularly the conversations they're having behind the scenes. And in many cases, a lot of the players are, are aren't certain. I, I've spoken to many players who said, like, I've spoken to so many, you know, I, 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 I'm not really ever told by those in management or CEO what's going on with X League, with, you know, this model, like, where is it going? And often there's just a lot of confusion. So where we want to jump in that space, I suppose, is where we could say, you know, we just show, um, you know, either what's been like reported or announced or not confirmed or I don't know. Um, the, the one thing kind of interesting thing I noticed is uh, when there's clear disagreements between what a tournament organizer is okay with and with say what a publisher isn't. So for example, one of the big scandals last year was the, uh, the uh, it was a match fixing scandal with I Buy Power, it was a CSGO team. And they were essentially uh, given a lifetime ban, which is, is quite an extreme punishment. And so then uh, Ian Smith from uh, the Esports Integrity Coalition um, worked with uh, another, another lawyer based in the EU, Anna Bauman, and they eventually managed to lift those bans with ESL and DreamHack, so they were only temporary. But Valve has still kept those bans lifetime. So that's this clear, um, you know, clear break in the chain, I guess you could say, between the publisher, the tournament organizer, and the player, where the player did something wrong, they admitted to it, and there's not a set punishment between everyone. Everyone has a different idea of what the outcome should be. And in terms of we fit in that, we can you know, offer our op opinion, we can um, allow different parties to offer their opinions, um, or we can just kind of map out the whole mess <laughs> and, um, um, and basically let the audience decide what's, what's, what's right and what's wrong. Right, so you were talking about you know, the, uh, the ways that you know, teams can be affected by a lot of different 
um, entities that they interact with very differently because maybe you play in three different tournaments and they have three different sets of rules. So how do you follow each one? You know, the, everything looks a little bit different. So the need for maybe standardization there. Um, so to direct a question to a, you know, someone who works directly with teams there, Mr. Her at the end, um, what, what does the uh, esports infrastructure look for you as you look to develop these you know, synergies with different uh, either tournament organizers or publishers as you look for your players to compete in these leagues and these tournaments? Uh, what is that like for you and what, what would you like to ideally have as the synergy between your relationship and the tournaments your players play in? Yeah, um, I think you know, one of our stated goals is that over the next 12 months, we will be forming a top team across you know, every major esports game in Korea, which is, you know, a good chunk of the esports games out there. Um, so this is near and dear to our hearts. We got to figure this out. Um, and in terms of the current state of where it is, uh, I, I actually worked with a very uh, well-known UX designer out in, out in SF who said, you know, if, if you don't design your life, somebody else will design it for you. So I think we're at that point where, you know, we can't just sit back uh, and see how things are going to develop. I actually do think it's time to you know, put a stake in the ground and say, look, we want to treat these professional players like professionals. Uh, that's what we're doing, right? We want to make sure they get paid a salary, that they're professionals, they're the best in the world. I mean, I would say one of the best in the world, just cognizant of all the other great countries that are out <laughs> here today. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's kind of our stake in the ground, is that, you know, we really want to try to accelerate uh, the, the teams, especially in Korea, how they're viewed on a global level. We want to make sure that, you know, we're the best team that, you know, any global league or sponsor uh, or game publisher, when they think Korea, they should be thinking us, and they should be thinking KSV. So that's kind of how we think. Uh, I think first for us is getting a seat at the table to help design what this should look like, because we're at that point where, you know, uh, where if we don't design it, somebody else will, because this thing is too big now. Um, and I think it's already happening, especially uh, if you look around the world, uh, I think you're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, uh, people with vested interest changing it and forming it and designing it the way they want to versus I think, you know, if the industry can come together, figure out what makes sense or even have a forum like this where we can talk about what we think we need to do, I think that's a good, really good first step in, in getting this uh, ball moving forward for, for the betterment of, of the entire league and entire industry. Um, I just wanted to add to that by saying, I think part of what you're saying as well is there's just a, because there's a lack of standardization, everything kind of feels like an experiment. <laughs> so like, I, I really like what ESL is doing with WISA, but even then, you know, this idea of creating a, a federation, you know, a, a kind of a standardized way of making sure players get a fair salary, that fairs get a, the teams get a fair share of um, tournament winnings, but it's still the first of its kind. And so there's gonna be a lot of room for experimentation and any other organizations that come up in other parts of the world are gonna have different ways of doing it. And you see this a lot in the collegiate scene in America where um, you, know, you have right now, I think three or four organizations that all want to kind of poise themselves as we're the, the North American uh, College Esports Association, not, knowing, not all of them knowing that if the NCAA, for example, decided to jump into the space at any point, they're all gonna be locked in a massive battle. And um, the problem is like, everyone's kind of doing this for the first time and no one really knows the, the best approach. All they have is a few models from traditional sports which doesn't have to worry about intellectual property rights or anything like that. I know, Mr. Palmer, you uh, mentioned WISA earlier as uh, one step towards uh, trying to either standardize uh, the space or help uh, coordinate or help aid in communication uh, between everyone involved in sort of the esports structure. Um, as that works towards developing, you know, uh, or smoothing out conversation between relevant uh, parties, um, what is it kind of what have, what have you seen kind of change over at least your time in your role and even maybe comparing that to your role before entering eSports? Uh, what have you seen be kind of the trend or the change in the way that this communication happens? Well, it's, it's, it's a professionalizing because um, there's, there's more, mon more money in the system, more people do it for, for, for a living, and we, we all... We, are, we can't copy paste everything that happened in classical sports for sure, but but we can learn from the from the way of tackling problems, from the way of, of structuring uh, things, and I think we're doing pretty okay already. And uh, that the players have a say. There's somebody on the board uh, 
of, of Weser from, from, the, from the player side, and we take this very seriously. And of course, we, um, uh, to, to, to put it very, very openly, we, we're not only doing it for charity's sake, but be, because we want to attract people. Yeah? We want to attract people to, 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 to buy tickets, to, to watch it. This is what the, the, the core business of our company is. So we have to take this, we have to take it very seriously that everybody wants transparency, everybody wants a, a, a level playing field, and, and if we orientate this all along this, these lines, we are, we are fine, but there's still a, a lot of work to be done, as we said before. Uh, so to Namakawa san to ask from kind of the publisher's perspective, um, you're tasked with developing uh, this business globally, and so that comes with interacting with community, with players, with teams, all of that. What are some of the, I guess, challenges that you have when you look to uh, synergize your uh, eSport globally? Are, what are the difficulties or the, the struggles that come with taking a product like uh, you, the games that you manufacture and exporting it to the community through the vehicle of eSports? Um, I think, and I, I already talked about it again, so it, it is kind of hard to, you know, reach out to like a kind of small countries or like, a, and it's like, a, you know, we always been accessing in America or, you know, the European countries, or it's like, you know, we haven't reached with, uh, you know, African and then any other com small community as well. But I think in the community, comes first. I mean, we think the community is very important for us, you know, giving us an improvement of our game. So this is like a challenge. Esports is a great opportunity for us to, you know, uh, reach out to those kind of, you know, community as well. So I think, you know, that's kind of our challenge right now to, you know, reach out and hearing that, you know, picking up the voice from the, like, uh, any other community as well, I mean, all community as well. So at least from your perspective, how would you like things to uh, improve moving forward? What would help make that communication more effective? Um, it's like, you know, it's like, you know, uh, we uh, always getting feedback from like a big voice. It's like, you know, it's like a new Jerry. It's like we hear like, you know, first priority was like a big voice, but you know, I think it's like a small voice it has like also important things. So, you know, we definitely want to hear and, you know, you know, getting like, you know, improving our game, you know, feedback and that stuff, yeah. Yeah, very important for all voices to be represented. And I think uh, even when uh, Mr. Palmer was talking about the uh, purpose of a lot of the organization, the communication uh, is for all voices to kind of have a way to, to be heard. Um, there's a lot of different voices involved when it comes to uh, the concept of, of eSports. So maybe to just pose a general question to everyone. Um, what do you think the best way is for big voices, small voices, all voices uh, to be represented? Is it through an organization like IESF, WISA? What does that you know, maybe look like or what is important to making that possible? It's a pretty general question, so I understand if everybody has a slightly different take on it, but just like to hear some commentary on what uh, is important to making uh, it possible for all voices to kind of be heard? Uh, we are reluctant, not because the, the question is too general, but because it's so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least that's, that, that's my Just bite my, off my a view. small chunk, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, one of the greatest philosophers in, in sport, Mike Tyson, he said, everybody's busy making plans and then, then you get punched in the face. Uh, um, <laughs> It's, if, it, it, no, nobody knows the answer to this question, I, I guess. What, what, the only thing that helps is um, going step by step, knowing that being, being very clear and transparent about, about the challenges and trying to speak with, with everybody. And this is why I'm, I'm emphasizing the, the, the idea of, of platform and, and forums, because I think it's, it's definitely needed that we, need st that we have structured communication. Mm -hmm. no? And I, I, I talked about the chimney. It, it, everything works right in the chimney, but the problem is there are a zillion other chimneys as well. No? So this, is, has, this has to be aligned. No? And so I would, I would really encourage uh, the, the, the publishers, for example, to take this very seriously. There are still some publishers, and we all love them, but, um, but, <laughs> but there are still some, some, some publishers that uh, 
uh, have the vision of eSport more or less like a, a, a one, one of many marketing tools. Uh, uh, and if, if the, the most relevant publishers would all um, think about eSport as a, a, a sp the, the, the biggest sport entertainment industry to, 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 to be in a couple of years and cherish it like this, this would be, this would be a, a, a great help. And then we could start, we could start from there. Huh? And where we end up, uh, probably, probably perhaps somebody from the audience can, can answer this <laughs> later, but I'm, I'm unable. This is where I remind everyone that there will be question and answers coming later on, so think of them during the, uh, the panel, and then you can provide the answers to questions like Mr. Palmer's later on. Well, I think it's, it's even interesting if you look at the way the, the two big competitions of, of next year, I guess you could say the North American LCS and the Overwatch League were announced. You know, every, everyone's known the teams that are going to be involved before the, the, the publishers put it out, and that's because there were certain journalists who had certain contacts in those companies. And so you have to look at the way then that the publishers then deal with this because they, they obviously, and also then how the teams deal with this. Like, do they have to like kind of either to completely stay silent or do they just like, res I think um, I did see one or two teams during the NA LCS announcements, you know, just respectfully tell teams not to, to, to wait, to wait patiently. Others just said nothing. Um, it's not even a case of giving everyone a voice. It's making sure everyone knows exactly how to react to certain revelations, to certain scandals as well. I mean, we've seen with the uh, the CSGO skin betting market, um, that was a case where the developer tried to solve a problem and kind of made it worse. Um, it, it, it's, 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 it's a case of, um, I don't know, if you, if you give them a voice, they can't always be on their terms. You know, most publishers want to kind of announce things in the kind of this graceful, you know, long video form style way, but sometimes it's, it, it can't always be on their terms. All right, taking a little bit of a uh, transition here, we've talked about kind of the conversations that need to be had and how the synergies are starting to develop between different members in the chain. But um, one of the points for discussion that I'd like to hear your opinions on are uh, esports added value to society. And uh, we've talked about each one of the players in kind of the esports chain, but we haven't really talked very much about the, uh, the fans or society and the benefit that esports has there. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Herr mentioned earlier the close relationship that uh, individual esports teams have with the fans, with society, but I'd like to hear a little bit more about uh, what each of you think the benefit of esports is to society from your different uh, perspectives. So uh, maybe starting with uh, Mr. Uh, Namikawa, talking about what you think the benefit of esports is to society as a publisher. Um, so um, I think it's like another you know, publisher. It's like in you know, esports, it's a it's a good thing for like uh, or the like uh, because um, esports could play with like uh, uh, you know younger to like an you know, older people. I mean, it's like you know usually it's like a game is kind of evil. I mean, it's like all you know, parents doesn't want kids to you know playing with the games as well. But you know if you know esports could be like an you know, or like an other e sports, so. Maybe could change that you know parents could understand you know what the, you know careers over the esports and you know, so this esports is had like a kind of brain kind of storming like a strategy things on that so that might be like an you know, interesting thing because in the game you know you know playing game is like the good things uh, it's you know it, they change the mind on that you know that might be the good for the society and for us too yeah definitely synergy there moving forward yeah uh, esports is in. It's fair play. Esport is inclusive per se. In inclusive, it's per se global. I, I know we have national competitions, but th this is the only sport that is really from the from from scratch a, a global a global sport. It, it, it teaches you a lot about um, um, abilities that are definitely needed in this in these disruptive and digital digitalized times. Well, complicated word, and uh, the. It, it, it's always tough for, for generations that are that have gray hair like 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 myself uh, uh, to understand what what younger people do. But um, our CEO he's always um, referring to to uh, the book. Yeah, let's let's this let's do this thought experiment. Yeah, there's no books, and somebody invents a book, and then society says, well, this is this is 
this is dangerous. Huh? You just do it on your own. Just no, no social communication involved. You are sitting all the time. Huh? You're just with your book, huh? sitting. Huh? You don't move. Huh? Very dangerous. And what's most dangerous, you can't control what, what people think while reading a book. Huh? Very dangerous for parents. Huh? What, do, what do children do? At, at, they, perhaps they, they have thoughts that are not, not apt or dangerous even. Huh? I mean, it's just a joke, but that's just to explain that um, it, it's, it, there's, a, there's a gap between uh, mo most of the elder generation and, 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 and younger people. And as we all know, I, I, I remember this when I, were young, when I was young, I, I, the, 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 the uncoolest thing I could do would, would be to explain my parents why I found something cool. So, so <laughs> the, I think this is just a matter where we need a bit of, 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 of patience still and education. Um, I would, from my perspective, I would say the biggest benefit esports has to society is, is the opportunities it creates. I mean, just by the way we've created the, sy the matchmaking system, you can go from a nobody to someone of note in esports in the space of a month if you're good enough. And presumably you can work in a team without swearing at your teammates <laughs> too much. Um, but even in, in, the, in the, the career space, I, I mean, I've spoken to so many uh, data science students now who've completely switched their thesis once they got into esports and realized, oh wow, I can apply all the, my data knowledge to, you know, years worth of gameplay and, and build these incredible models out of it. Um, for me, that, that, that's why I think the opportunity leaves, it, the, um, the benefit it leaves in society is the opportunities it creates. But um, even for someone in, in media, um, you know, I, I've seen a lot of, um, uh, you know, journalists who, like myself, had, had, tr had tried sort of, you know, doing, uh, tried journalism in various other industries where, you know, we, we all hear about how print is dying and, and how, you know, a lot of different fields of journalism are going down, but esports journalism, journalism is one of the most thriving forms of journalism because you can tackle it in so many different ways as well. Um, you know, when I, when I think about, I think a lot of the themes that, you know, you guys touched on are, are true and this is what, what we think as well is, you know, really three things. One is competition, right? This is the only sport where you have global competition on a truly global scale. Uh, and that's really enabled by the second thing, which is global accessibility. Um, it, it, this is the lowest barrier to entry out there, um, outside of owning a PC, which, you know, a lot of people have access to a PC, and hopefully more soon with mobile phones becoming ubiquitous. Uh, so I think that those two things are key traits, but I also think that it's very important that the players uh, in, in, in kind of the system, not just the actual game players, but the, the industry players, um, that, you know, when, whenever you're building a new industry, it, it can be for value creation or it, it can be for, you know, value destruction, right? And I, I think we have a responsibility to make sure that this goes the right way, right? Like, I think, you know, even though we are part of being on a, a as you mentioned, a rocket ship is that, you know, a, a crash on a rocket ship is a lot bigger uh, than a crash on, on a car or on a bicycle. So. You know, it's very important for us that, you know, even while we're on this rocket ship, that we do things the right way, that we make sure we treat the players the right way, the teams the right way, the publishers, the, you know, the leagues and everybody involved in the media. Um, because I, I do think it's important that, that we don't screw this up. Uh, because, you know, the stacks, the odds are stacked in our favor. I think we saw the, we saw the stats with uh, so just how youthful uh, the generation that's watching us is and how much growth there is in the industry. Um, and I think it's really important that the industry not screw it up. Um, and that will enable us to create new jobs, uh, create new opportunities. Um, even for us, when we're working with a lot of teams and a lot of players, you know, it's kind of their first time that they can be really proud and tell their parents about, you know, the fact that they have this great salary job instead of just working on a housing stipend or anything like that. And that feels awesome, right? Um, but we have to make sure that we continue to do this and we continue to build the industry because you know, if there's, if there's no industry, you know, the, the money runs out at some point. So, you know, I, I think that's something that's very important that we have to be cognizant of. All right, well, I believe that's going to bring us just about to the close of our panel session. Uh, before we open things up to a question and answer, if any of you have any final comments you'd like to make about the subject matter we've been talking about, now would be the time. 
So without further ado, let's go ahead and take some questions. So if you all have been doing your duty as a good audience, and I know you have, there are some questions out there. So if you feel free to raise your hands, we'll be sure to get you a microphone so that you can ask your questions. Let's see if I see any hands out there. Let's see one right in the middle. Hi, I'm Saeed Sharaf from Esports Middle East. Uh, in our region, mainly in the GCC, the biggest uh, markets are Saudi and the UAE. The most selling titles are the football one, whether it's Konami, Pro Evolution Soccer, or EA FIFA. And for us in our region, it's really a tier one. Uh, it's not Counter-Strike, not Dota 2, not League of Legends. And um, my question for the gentleman, uh, Shinji and Jane, as a publisher and uh, tournament organizers. Why we don't see football titles as major, uh, major tournaments? Uh, if we take it like uh, an eSport going to TV, it's much easier to be understood by the non-gamers. Of course, if you watch uh, Dota or League of Legends on TV, you will not understand anything. Uh, I mean for non-gamer, but football can be, so it have much bigger potential, but why we don't see it globally on a tier two or a three? Thank you. Um, um, as a Karami, it's like, you know, we are trying to, you know, reach out to those associations, but it's not enough, I think. It's like, you know, but you know, definitely it's like, a, you know, Arabic country is like a, one of the like, biggest, like a football fan, you know, up there. So I think, you know, like I said, our problem is like, you know, we are lack of resources, you know, to reach out to like in a country like that. So definitely if you know, somebody could, you know, reach out, you know, help us, you know, out to the, you know, reach out to an Arabic country, that would be great. Yeah, that's kind of another one issue, but what I mentioned. So maybe we can talk later on, yeah. Yeah, sure, definitely. All right, we have any more questions out there? I think I saw one hand right up in the front and also over there. Start in the front and work our way back. So right up front. If you'd raise your hand again. Uh, there we go. Um, so this question is uh, for Jan. Um, you mentioned about the ecosystem and working together and building um, an esports world with all these different organizations and publishers and federations work, right? So my question was, or is how does an ecosystem where ISF, national federations, and ESL coexist and collaborate together work? How cool NFs, national federations, and ESL cooperate? And what, what cool national federations offer to ESL and what could offer what ESL could offer to them? Well, um, I hope not to sound uh, arrogant or vain. Uh, we are a reality in the in, in, in the ecosystem, and we have a we have seven million uh, accounts digitally, and we're doing huge esport events. So, uh, what what we do offer is collaboration, and I, I think. Um, IESF and the national federations, they are growing and growing, and it takes some time. That's completely natural. And the, the, the moment IESF and national, national federations are able to, uh, to really impose rules and to uh, set up standards, that's the right time to, to think about how, how, we could do this to, to, how, how we can do this together. And I think there's a, a, still a huge, huge potential for, for federations to, to help to develop and structure the market in, in, in nearly everywhere in the world. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm supporting this from, from the ESL side. All right, right up here in front. Yeah, thank you for the insightful uh, panel discussion. Uh, my name is Fabian Tan, and I'm from the Singapore Economic Development Board. Uh, one of our main role is to really develop the games ecosystem in Singapore and esports is uh, a rising trend that we are watching very carefully. Uh, I'm from the government of Singapore and one of the things that we do is uh, we actually provide training grants to the industry, to the ecosystem 
uh, to the companies to develop new talent. Uh, my question is more about talent development. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, in the esports ecosystem, what kind of talent do you see as critical uh, that, we, that, is, uh, that, that the current industry lacks? So it could be from the technical perspective, maybe you need more software engineers, network engineers, or it could be from the business development perspective where you're looking at uh, esports events coordinator, uh, sales managers. Is it a different breed from existing businesses? Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll try to field that one. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think you're in luck. Uh, I think across the board, uh, there, this industry is growing faster than the talent pool. So whether you, you've basically named all of the areas where there needs to be more great, talented people. And I think this is something that esports as an industry should do a better job of, is, is really talking about how much it's actually growing the number of jobs that are out there that this industry is actually creating, whether it's great writers, whether it's you know, um, people that are physicians, like sports physicists, or sports uh, physicians, sorry, not physicists, maybe that's later. Sports psychologists sports as well. Sports psychologists as well, because this is one of the most stressful things, right? Anybody that's ever raged uh, you know, in league or any of these other games, you know, you, you know how stressful this could be. Um, none of these are actually developed. What, even something as simple as sponsorship sales, right? Like if you look at the industry, very few sports sponsorship uh, salespeople have ever played Overwatch or League of Legends or any of these things, right? So I think even on training grounds, uh, even on broadcasting, even on video editing, we've noticed that there should be a lot more talent out there that knows not to just pick, uh, one of the most interesting things that, we, that happened to us is we, at, we got a, a professional studio to do some video editing for us, and they picked uh, a video of Widowmaker, uh, that's a character in Overwatch, you guys should all know this, uh, just walking along as the, the video that they wanted to shoot. Whereas somebody that actually plays a game would be like, wait, that flick shot was amazing. So I think across the board, if you look at the sports world as kind of an analogy, you, you definitely need talent all the way across that board. So I think in general, making the investments into uh, the economy um, you know, and creating these jobs are very beneficial. And we are looking to hire. So if you, do, if you, if you know of any great talent in, in the industry, please feel free to reach out. So just to add to that, um, whilst you need to know exactly what talent you need, it's, it's also good to understand how familiar they need to be with the industry. Um, because Jan's a good example of someone who came from outside the industry and, and has clearly done very well and done good things within it. Um, but then I've known people who, who were also very much attached to the industry and then moved on to new positions. So for example, last week it was announced that Tobias Sherman, who was the global head of esports for WME IMG, he helped build E-League, which is one of the big uh, competitions in America, he's now creating his own game studio. Now, whilst I'm curious to see, you know, how, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know what his background is in game development, you know, running a company like that and how well he'll tackle game development for the first time, but to have someone who's kind of gone through the esports, um, you know, training camp, now actually building esports from the ground up is really interesting. And, um, you know, it, it's really interesting as well to see how, oh, He'll tackle that, tackle that, as I mentioned earlier, from an IP perspective. Like, will he provide more freedom with his, with his titles than some of the larger developers will because he understands how difficult licenses and rights, um, the challenges those pose in esports. So it's a case not only of, um, you know, what particular talent you need, but you need to also figure out how entrenched in gaming culture, in memes, all that stuff, <laughs> they, they actually should be because it's nice sometimes to have an outside perspective. I think we have time for a couple more questions. So, I already uh, have the mic, Reed. <laughs> I can't see you behind the podium, so you'll have to speak up. So first of all, congratulations to everyone on the panel. I just really wanted to come out and say, Jan, thank you for the, the best line I've ever heard in my life, which is the great sports philosopher is Mike Tyson. He's my favorite boxer on planet Earth, so that really got to me. And regarding the business side of it, uh, I'd just like to comment and ask, of course, your feedback on it. I see, traditionally speaking, in most sport, in most international sport, the historical progression comes with people of passion that have no business sense and no business background to be able to put together and commercialize a value asset, rather working at the beginning from their own passion and their own experience in a sport. And later, as development proceeds, if you take FIFA, for example, how FIFA was financed at its beginning, and how it was never a business until later on. 
I think that you are all in the unique position where you have lots of business sense, you have knowledge of the market, you have experience, you've created great products that are today being commercialized. And on the other spectrum, you have an international federation that's trying to unite and combine you. And if I notice properly, all of you have talked about the same thing. Standardization, standard, standardization, and unity. And it, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I get from your presentation is that with your help in your specific fields and with everyone's contribution in their fields from IP holders to huge event organizers, to league managers, and of course the national federations and international federations, you can really work together and come together to sign a accord or a memorandum of understanding outlining the tools, the responsibilities, and the uniquenesses of each party, protecting yourselves individually in your business while contributing as a whole to grow and bake the pizza. So that's, that's what my feeling is, and I, I'd like your comment if you agree, if you see it a different way. But thank you for the Tyson quote. Yeah. I, I'm not 100% sure we agree to all of that, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, I think a treaty is going a little bit far. Uh, I don't think we're at the NATO stage yet. Uh, but I think I do agree that there is kind of a general consensus that we are all on the same rocket ship. That I mean, one thing, uh, as somebody who's, you know, relatively new to esports in general, is that I've been very excited by how uh, supportive other people are to grow this. I think we're all on the same team. And that's a sense that I get. You know, it's almost very similar to early days in Silicon Valley. It's very similar to any startup where you have a startup community. So I do get that sense. I don't know if we're ready for a treaty or a treatise or anything like that. Uh, but I'll, I'll pass these on to more experienced folks over here for how they feel about a treaty. Well, I, I completely agree. But the word treaty, it, it's perhaps it, it's, it's, it's a bit too far fetched for, for the time being. But I, 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 I'm, I'm supporting you because um, I think we have the unique opportunity to create something like this. Yeah? Other sports organizations, they've been around for 100 years. And obviously, speaking about FIFA and IOC, they haven't done everything right. <laughs> you can read this every day in the newspaper. OK, nobody reads newspapers anymore. <laughs> uh, but you can, you can learn about this in this <laughs> internet thing. Uh, so <clears throat> yeah, I, I think we have the, 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 the rare opportunity to create something even better. And this is what we should strive for. All right, let's see if we have about time for one more question. I see a big hand raised way back in the back. Um, my name is Thomas. I'm from the Danish Esports Federation. The ESL guys are coming to, to our country in the beginning of December. So I think the challenge is to uh, how do we merge the commercial with the non-commercial. So as a federation, our challenge is to meet the boundaries that our state, government, anti-doping Denmark, and everybody is setting up for us actually to be able to um, work as a non-profit uh, federation. Uh, you guys are in it for the money, fine by me. We are in it for moving the gamers from their rooms down to a social context where they can game with each other and actually participate just as who they are. So we have the masses, we have all the gamers. You guys would like to catch up with them so you can earn your money. So uh, why not work together? That wasn't a question, no? But, but a statement. I mean, it sounds like a great idea to me. Okay, um, I'm not sure exactly what the... Uh, what the question was uh, there, so maybe you can. <laughs> okay, we all like to get our salary check. You guys also would like to build a business. That's fine. But we also need to look at the grassroots within the gaming. And the grassroots is the many people who like to game, but not in a professional setup. But they always look up the pyramid. They look up against the professionals, they want to be like them, but very, very few, as we heard earlier today, are making it. So instead of, you know, looking at we are two different ident identities, we need to see how can we actually make this happen so we give something back to the grassroots, even though 
you guys are working with the professionals, earning probably a good amount of money on that. How can we actually get some of that funding back to the grassroots so we can keep on having the feeding chain, getting the professionals, you know, new ones coming in and all that. So, cooperation, are you ready? Should we meet in Copenhagen in early December and uh, take the discussion there? So we are flirting, yeah, yeah, let's, let's meet. Yeah, that, uh, you're, you're completely right. Pyramids are built from bottom up and for everybody in, you, you want to sell your games, you, you want to, we are, we are all from the economic side of it, we are on the same page there yeah? because we all want it to grow and it only grows if, if the, the ecosystem grows overall and if the grassroots movement is, 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 is strong. All right, it sounds like a good answer to your question. So hopefully that, is, uh, that resolves it. Um, let's see, I think we are about ready to close things out. So uh, any final comments from our panel? All right, well then without further ado, why don't you give us a big round of applause for our panelists?